This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. When you're searching for personal care products like a bar of soap or a bottle of lotion, are you reading the ingredients label? What harmful ingredients should we be avoiding? A recent study from the Journal of the National Cancer Institute found potential links between the regular use of hair straightening products like relaxers to uterine cancer. This prompted a new federal lawsuit. And there are other troubling findings around some deodorants containing benzene and powders containing talc contaminated with asbestos. Researchers at the University of Notre Dame found PFAS, or PFAS, sometimes called forever chemicals, in 52% of cosmetics, and only a fraction of those products listed PFAS on the label. Today on Where We Live, we hear from local makers who are focused on safe and sustainable ingredients. But first, we will speak with the environmental working group who has been building a database of different products and ingredients for almost two decades, hoping to make it easier for people to shop smart. And joining us to discuss that is Melanie Benish. She's the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Environmental Working Group, or EWG. Thanks for joining us, Melanie. Uh, Thanks so much, Catherine. Happy to be here. Melanie, can we start with, uh, tell us about what the Skin Deep database is and what's the EWG's broader mission to put that information out there for consumers um, to read or check out before they buy things? Yeah. Um, So we launched our database called Skin Deep in 2004, really with the idea of creating online profiles for cosmetics and personal care products and their potential hazards and health concerns. And our aim really is to fill in where industry and the government uh, left off. Um, Companies are allowed to use almost any ingredient that they want. Uh, The U.S. government doesn't regularly review the safety of cosmetics before they're sold. And so our staff scientists compare the ingredients and personal care product labels um, and websites to information in nearly 60 toxicity and regulatory database. And so... Um, now our, our database provides uh, consumers with, with what we think are pretty easy to navigate ratings um, for a wide range of products and ingredients. And so it's a way to look up any ingredients of concern or look up any product um, that you may be using if you want to understand more about the ingredients that are in it. And that really fits into our broader mission as an organization to empower consumers, um, to give them the information that they need to make healthier choices for them and their families. Um, And then I do a lot of work trying to translate what we're learning um, into better policies so that the burden doesn't fall entirely on consumers, but that the government is also doing their job to make sure that we're safe. And you're right. We all kind of gave it a, a go earlier, and it's really easy to use and, and easy to read and, and figure out. But can you share with us, you know, the scores for each ingredient? How how are those determined? Um, how do they work? And we can get into that in a little bit more. Um, sure. So generally, there is a hazard rating that reflects known and suspected hazards that are associated with ingredients and products. Uh, It considers potential health hazards, but doesn't always account for exposure or individual susceptibility, um, which are also factors that will drive health risks, if any, but are generally not available. Um, And these are shown as low, moderate, or high concern categories with numeric rankings uh, that range from one, which is low concern, to 10, which is high concern. Um, And then we also have a data availability rating, um, primarily to describe the extent to which low hazard scores are associated with some ingredients or products are based on definitive data that shows health demonstrating, uh, that shows uh, health hazard or safety, um, or um, on the other extreme that may show in your absence of data. Um, And so we also uh, include a data availability rating so you can know a little bit more about how much we actually know about an ingredient. So not, not all cosmetics chemicals have been thoroughly studied and so, some may rank low for hazards only because uh, because only a little bit of research has done. Right. And you mentioned a lot of hazardous materials. Do you, Are there any different risks that can up any ingredients of score? Um, I, I mean, certainly if there is any cancer risk, um, that, that is of great concern to us. Um, 
And then I, I, I mean, also getting back to the data availability, we um, flag a lot of products that are have fragrances in them. And that's in part because uh, if you look at your ingredient label, it's often just going to say fragrance as one of the ingredients, um, but it isn't going to tell you all of the individual chemicals that make up that fragrance. And so some of those ingredients may be of concern, others may not be of concern, but because that is a trade secret that the cosmetics industry doesn't have to disclose on the label, um, under the current law, there there are some changes to the law that I'm happy to talk about that that may create a little more transparency in this area. But we tend to flag fragrances because it's impossible uh, often to calculate the risk because we don't know what those individual ingredients are. Well, and with the word fragrance, and I, I'm glad that you mentioned it because I do want to talk about that too. And, and the fact that you mentioned it's sort of a trade secret for these companies. Are there things that consumers can know, should know? What, what would you what, what would you tell a consumer when you when when they see the word fragrance in in a bottle of lotion or something? Yeah, um, I, I would exercise caution um, because we uh, if the company has not disclose that list of ingredient and sometimes a company will have a like a smart label so a qr code that you can scan where you may be able to get that list but a lot of companies do not um and so it's it's just sort of a gamble you don't know what chemicals are going to be in that fragrance um unless they've disclosed um and, and most of the time they will not have one exception is for um in addition to our skin deep database we also have ewg verified products and so if something is EWG verified, um, our scientists would have closely reviewed um, everything that's in that product, including fragrance ingredients, before sort of giving it our, our seal um, to show that it's, uh, it, we believe that it's a low risk product for, for consumers. So when it comes to that, and you you mentioned you know FDA regulating or not regulating these ingredients, so can you share with us, you know, how does the FDA regulate these ingredients then? Yeah, um, so historically cosmetics, um, and when I talk about cosmetics, I'm really talking about all kinds of personal care products. So that includes your shampoos and your lotions, um, but they have been one of the least regulated categories of consumer products. The law was passed in 1938 and then did not get a significant update until just a few months ago in December of 2022. Um, even with the modernization of the law, which really gives the FDA a lot more oversight ability, um, a lot more sort of ministerial functions that I think a lot of people would assume that they already have, um, there's still no pre-market review of cosmetic ingredients. So companies are still pretty free to use uh, whatever they like in their products um, with, without asking the government first. Um, and so it's really only after a problem has been identified that the FDA um, is able to step in and take action. Well, and you you mentioned the recent uh, modernization of Cosmetics Regulation Act. Of, I mean, it's twenty. it was in 2022. Can you tell us about some of those tools that we can use now, or I, I should say companies can use now? Yeah, so it, it is a really important step forward. Uh, for the first time, companies will be required to register with the FDA. So the FDA for the first time will really know where all the companies are and which cosmetics they're manufacturing in their facilities, um, which was not previously the case. Um, and that may sound like a small thing, but if, uh, if there's a problem with one of these products, um, it really increases the FDA's ability to step in um, and, and quickly do something about it. Um, it also gives the FDA a much better data set to try and estimate exposure to some of these chemicals because for the first time they will know how broadly some of them are used. Uh, there are also new requirements to ensure that uh, these products are actually made in a clean and sterile environment, which uh, all of those Guidelines were previously uh, voluntary under the old law. They are now mandatory. Um, companies, for the first time, when they get complaints from consumers uh, that they've had harms uh, from using these products, uh, will have to turn that information over to FDA for the first time. And then FDA will also have a lot more authority to look at company safety records um, to make sure that uh, if the company is saying that an ingredient is safe, that they've actually got the data to back it up. 
And I'm wondering too, you know, how does the U.S. differ from other countries in terms of regulation? Because I think there's quite a bit of a difference. There is quite a bit of a difference. Um, for example, in Europe, I think there's 1,600 ingredients that are banned from use in cosmetics, whereas the FDA has only restricted nine ingredients for use in cosmetics uh, for safety reasons. Um, and there is much more of a precautionary um, data requirements uh, system in places like Europe um, where you have to show more uh, to prove the safety of your ingredients uh, and the safety of your products before you can bring it onto the market. And when a product is marketed as organic or natural, you know, what does that guarantee? And how does that relate to what is also sometimes referred to as greenwashing? Yeah, um, so neither of those terms are regulated in the cosmetic space. The only the only exception would be if you have some sort of agricultural ingredient, like for example, an argon oil, um, then you might have a product that actually carries the USDA organic seal. Um, but many products that are marketing themselves as organic, um, there isn't a seal for those cosmetics. There isn't any sort of FDA oversight or definition of what it means for a personal care product to be organic. Likewise, there's not a definition of what it means for something to be natural. Um, and so you are sort of just taking those companies at their word. And just a quick reminder for our listeners that the EWG's database is online at ewg.org slash skin deep. You can also find more information on our website at ctpublic.org slash where we live. You've been listening to Melanie Benish. She's the Vice President of Government Affairs, Environmental Working Group, or EWG, and she will be staying with us. After the break, we'll hear from one small business owner who's focused on safe ingredients. This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. Personal care products like deodorant and body lotion aren't always made with safe and sustainable ingredients. One small business owner here in Connecticut took matters into her own hands, and she is joining me now. Sammy Jo Artis is the founder and chief beauty maker of Flora Apothecary. Thanks so much, Sammy, for joining us today. Thanks so much, Catherine. So, Sammy, I want to start by asking you if you can tell us your story and, and share with us, you know, when did you decide that you wanted to do this for yourself? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think it's so great that you started this conversation with Melanie and EWG because that's exactly how I started. Um, I was actually selling Avon products, and frankly, I wasn't very good at it. I was pretty much just selling to friends and family, <laughs> um, and I noticed one day that my favorite body wash just contained all of these super long chemical names that I, you know, couldn't pronounce, didn't know what they were. I started to Google some of them and wound up on EWG's Skin Deep Cosmetics database, um, researching the chemicals and, you know, as Melanie said, how toxic they were. Um, and I was pretty shocked by what I found. And that shock sounds like it led to a lot of self-education and um, happy to hear that EWG was a huge resource for you because that's how I'm kind of starting my own black hole of information getting with my own products. Um, what were some <laughs> other resources along your journey that sort of helped you get to where you are today? Yeah, so I pretty much started by, you know, throwing out everything that was really, um, you know, rated very uh, highly toxic um, on EWG's database. Another another great app is um, Think Dirty. Um, that's another one where you can actually look up products, same as EWG, and you can also um, you can also scan barcodes um, when you're in the store shopping. So that's super convenient. Um, and, you know, I realized that there were some natural beauty brands out there, but there was a lot of, you know, as you mentioned and Melanie mentioned before, there's a lot of greenwashing happening. So there were companies that were maybe using really great natural organic ingredients, but they were, you know, throwing them in alongside some toxic chemical preservatives. Um, and, you know, you're, you're really not getting a better product at that point. So I, I started making my own. Um, I started with really easy sugar scrubs that, you know, anyone can really make as long as you've got sugar and an oil. Um, and I, you know, kind of went down my own black hole of, you know, learning each, essentially replacing like each product that I had bought from another company um, by something that I could make myself. 
Uh, and at the same time, I'm, uh, I am, I consider myself a witch. So my spirituality revolves around nature and being close with nature. And I was teaching myself herbalism and learning just all about um, natural ingredients and things that we can get from the earth and how they can benefit both, you know, our, our physical, our mental health, as well as our beauty. Um, and, uh, and so that just naturally went along with, you know, what I was creating. Um, and, you know, nature obviously plays a big role here. And I want to ask about what are your thoughts about ethical sourcing, especially, you know, land stewardship plays a big part of this. And you're a small business owner here in Connecticut. You know, how, what are your thoughts about that? And how do you go about um, making sure that your sources are ethical? Yeah, that is super important to me. Um, so obviously, being someone who is uh, nature based, has a nature based spirituality, I want to protect and preserve nature for as long as possible. So um, I I think that's another thing that like, you can't necessarily get from an ingredient label, right? You need to actually talk to who's creating your products um, in order to really get at that story behind the label. Um, but I, uh, I source as many ingredients as possible um, that are organic and fair trade. And um, as Melanie mentioned, you know, there's really no um, body that can determine if a if a final product is organic. Um, but there are, you know, the the um, USDA organic label does apply to ingredients. So I'm sourcing USDA organic certified ingredients. I'm sort of I'm sourcing fair trade ingredients. So ingredients where the workers are paid a living uh, wage in order to, you know, um, obtain whatever ingredient. Um, and I'm working with companies that I know are doing a really good job protecting the land, making sure they're not over harvesting, um, whether they're, you know, harvesting herbs uh, just for herbs uh, or, you know, creating essential oils out of them. And you're mentioning essential oils. Can you walk us through how that world is like? Because it's, I think recently it's been, or not recently, but I mean fairly recently, it's becoming a very big sort of area that people are getting into. But it sounds like it's also another complicated world. Can you uh, walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I will tell you, I could certainly get on a, a pedestal a little bit about essential oils. Um, there's there's been a lot of companies, um, you know, multi level marketing companies uh, that come out with essential oils, and I always get a little bit nervous when someone asks me um, what essential oils I'm using because I know that I'm either about to get pitched to buy, you know, essential oils from them because they're part of one of these MLMs. Or, you know, they're actually genuinely curious. And then I know that I can have a great conversation about land stewardship with them. Um, but yeah, there there are a lot of multi-level marketing companies um, that sell essential oils these days. And they have their own, you know, sort of fake certifications about how pure their oils are. Um, and again, there's no regulatory, you know, there's there's no regulation happening there they're making up their own labels. Um, and there's just a lot of misinformation about how they can be used neat on skin, which means, you know, not, um, you don't, you don't put it into like any kind of carrier oil. Um, and a lot of times that's actually really not safe. Um, and there's also a lot of misinformation about how you can add them to water and drink them. And if they're really good quality essential oils, that's actually pretty toxic and you're essentially drinking poison or putting poison directly onto your skin. Essential oils are really, for the most part, meant to be added in very small quantities to, you know, skincare products. And, you know, we've been talking about this over the last, you know, um, half hour-ish, and it sounds like there's there's just a lot going on. There's a lot of information. You really have to dig deep. Uh, do you have any tips that you would give our listeners who may have to stick to a certain brand or a certain market when they per when they buy their personal care. You know, what, what are some tips that you can give them to maybe shop better or just be healthier, I guess? Yeah. So, I mean, again, use, you know, use the Environmental Working Group's Skin Deep Cosmetics Database. It, it's, it's, there's so much information there. It's really meant to help us make these decisions much more easily. Think Dirty is another great app that you can use. Um, and, 
you know, knowing um, it, even if you can't tell where an ingredient is sourced, you know, I, I would suggest looking up, looking up the brand. You can, and you can email people too, you know, email, ask, like, if these things are important to you, ask, where are your, you know, where do you get your essential oils from? Where do you get your ingredients from? How many of them are organic? I frankly love it when people ask me that question because it's very important to me. It's a really important part of, of my brand um, and, and why I created Flora Apothecary. So I think, I think it's just really up to us as consumers to, um, unfortunately, you know, we, we can't really rely a whole lot on the FDA, um, but we do have resources. We can ask questions. And I think it's up to us to, to do that homework and ask the questions. And so you're out there having a lot of conversations with your customers or clients who have these questions. You know, can you tell us about the responses that you've gotten so far, you know, throughout your experience? What has that been like? Yeah, sure. So I, um, I feel like I, I feel like I have really helped empower a lot of women, which was part of my mission, especially founding Flora Apothecary after sort of during a really toxic breakup. Um, I have found that a lot of women, you know, as women and, and you know, as people in general, but definitely women more so um, were given really toxic messages about how we're supposed to look and how we're supposed to act and, you know, what ingredients and products we should be using every day and all that kind of stuff. And it's really my mission to help women. Um, I like to say I help women ditch toxic uh, chemicals, toxic thoughts and toxic people, um, because that's what I was doing. And, you know, when Flora Apothecary was born. Um, And so I I, coming from that um, from that place, I get a lot of really great uh, one on one, you know, heartfelt conversations with women about just, you know, their own journeys with their bodies and feeling shame about, you know, not being able to use a specific deodorant because it's just not working for them or, you know, having, um, having some kind of, some kind of skin rash that they, you know, want to fix, um, and help. And I feel like I've helped a lot of women, you know, really return to nature and return to their own, um, their own natural beauty and embrace their own natural beauty, um, through using non-toxic natural beautiful products. And, you know, we've been focusing this a little bit more on women, especially with the messaging and the products. And I think we tend to pay more attention to to things like this. But do you find, you know, how does men factor in with your mission? Do you find that they're less likely to make these kinds of considerations for themselves? You know, what has that experience been like for you? Yeah, I think I will say I have a lot of men who buy for women and I have women who buy for men as well. Um, and I've I've had a lot of conversations. I was just looking at um, some of my reviews the other day and um, I had a woman who bought, you know, some of my deodorant. And she was like, well, I have to buy another one because, you know, my husband stole mine. <laughs> so I think um, I think a lot of times women are gatekeepers in this area. And, you know, I know I certainly was with my husband. Um, he uses all of my products. Uh, I don't think, you know, I think before I came along, he was washing his, you know, his his face with the same soap that he used for his body. And that's fine if that works for you, you know. <laughs> Um, but I think, I think definitely women are the gatekeepers here, but I also really love that recently men have, um, increasingly become more and more interested. Um, you know, my brother was like addicted to chapstick and, you know, I, I kind of gave him a hard time about it. And finally he switched to my lip balm and realized, oh, this, this actually is a superior product. It's not drying out my lips. And then he bought, you know, some of my facial care uh, products and and body care products because he also gets like really dry skin. Um, so I think it's happening more and more. Um, and also, you know, a couple of years ago, my husband asked me when I was going to make products for men. And I was like, well, you know, it's not really, you know, my my purview here, but w- what else do you need? You use everything, you know, that I make. And, and he suggested that I make a beard oil. Um, because he gets what he calls beard rough, which is, you know, dry skin underneath his beard. Um, and so along with, you know, him and a couple of friends that we have who are barbers, I developed some beard oils and those have sold really well. I think, 
I think it's just, you know, beards are one way that men can really express um, their own, you know, have their own self-care and skincare routine. And so I really love being a part of that for men as well. I love that you mentioned your brother because I just said the same thing to mine that moisturizer is a thing and you can use it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it I mean, it's, it's easy to, you know, especially my brand is like very pink, right? So it's pretty easy to, to show that it's probably connected mostly to women, but men can use all this stuff too, and they should. You heard that here. And I we have a, about a minute left. But I do want to ask you really quickly because you do choose to use glasses as your for your products. Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So again, part of that, you know, um, me being very connected to nature and caring so much about nature is also um, making sure that my uh, jars don't end up in landfills. So I use glass jars and bottles um, for everything as well as paperboard tubes. So they're easily recyclable and reusable. You've been hearing from Sammy Jo Artis. She's the founder and chief beauty maker at Flora Pothcary. Sammy, thank you so much for sharing your story with us today. Thanks for having me. Just a quick reminder for our listeners that if you or a loved one are dealing with domestic violence, please visit ctsafeconnect.org or call or text 888-774-2900. Advocates are available 24-7. Also want to say a quick thanks to Melanie Benish. She's the Vice President of Government Affairs, Environmental Working Group, for staying with us. Thank you so much, Melanie. And coming up next, a natural hair care company is doing away with harmful ingredients. What questions or tips do you have when it comes to shopping smart? This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Catherine Shen. It can be a chore for us as consumers to investigate each ingredient in every personal care product we might use. Today, we're discussing how to identify and avoid those ingredients. But joining us now to discuss her small business is Mecca Davis Provide. She's the owner of Rutual's Natural Hair Care. Mecca, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Uh, Mecca, I want to start with how did you get started with your small business? Uh, well, my uh, venture into owning my own business was more on a personal level, uh, whereas my daughter was actually born with a, a scalp issue where she had eczema of the scalp. And I found that the products that were in the local hair supply stores did nothing but inflame the issue. Um, the doctors that we uh, went to uh, had remedies to fix the issue, but it destroyed the texture of her hair and her curl pattern and things of that nature. So after realizing that I had, it was up to me to do my due diligence and help my child. Um, that's what I did. I started doing my own research in different products, oils, and ingredients. And then I came up initially with an oil blend that uh, basically got rid of the eczema on the scalp, of which we still use today. That's amazing. And we just had a conversation with Sammy Joe, who is the owner for uh, Flora Apothecary, who's, who also went through a very similar uh, journey of self-education. Can you talk about, and you, t you just touched on it a little bit, but can you talk about more how that experience has been like? Was it difficult to figure, it all, that, figure all that out on your own? What resources did you use? It was. Uh, I primarily uh, started with the internet because that's just right there in front of me and I can do it at the comfort of my home. Um, it was difficult in the sense that I was unaware of what particular oils to blend, what particular oils didn't like each other, um, the dosages, things of that nature. That was very much so trial and error. Um, uh, then once I got through with the internet research, I actually went into like my... Uh, we have a particular uh, store that sells like essential and carrier oils and organic items. So I went in there and I kind of picked the brain of the um, the woman who dealt with the oils um, behind the counter. And she kind of gave me a little bit of insight on, you know, what I can expect to, when I blend and how to blend and things of that nature. So not only did I do the internet research, but I actually went to people who were very much um, educated in the field as well. And what were some of your concerns about harmful ingredients? Was that something that was an extension from your daughter's ex experiences? Did you did you find that during your own sort of self-education? And what was that process like? 
Yes. Um, so because I wasn't really sure what was causing the irritation or what would inflame the eczema, I kind of wanted to stay away from anything that could potentially be an issue. In order to do that, I had to learn what those things were. Um, so what I would do is I would just literally go into the uh, hair supply stores and turn the bottle of uh, product around and read the ingredients. And we all know that the ingredients are in their scientific name, so it was very difficult for me to understand it right there at that moment. So I would write it down, take it home, do my research, and do the aha moment when I figured out what it was. Um, so that's pretty much how I try to stay away from um, harsh uh, ingredients and chemicals and went more towards, like, um, more, you know, sensitive to the skin and, and, and scalp-type items. Well, I love your aha moment. I do find reading labels, sometimes it's like flipping open my high school chemistry book again. So yeah. <laughs> I wasn't, did not expect that to happen in my adult life. Um, and this is kind of a, a, an a obvious question, but is there a, a specific reason that you focus on natural ingredients? Is, is, is nature an important aspect of this whole process? Or is it just something that you learn to stay away from what can be harmful ingredients? Well, because I, the intention was to have my product, specifically my oil, as a generational thing, so meaning from baby to grandparents, I kind of wanted to make it as sensitive as possible. And in order to do that, I wanted to stray away from things that would keep them on the shelf for three or three to five years and things like that. So having the the idea that small children and older individuals would be using this in addition to everyone in between, I kind of had that in the back of my head, you know, that I wanted to put something out there that would be beneficial and safe for everyone, regardless of age. I love that you mentioned generational because that makes so much sense to me. And, and, um, what were some of the challenges that you encountered when you were trying to uh, figure out who were the trustworthy sellers of your ingredients? Oh, very good question. Um, that took a lot of emptying my bank account. I'm going to be very honest. <laughs> um, because, again, when you're starting from, some, from nowhere, you have to kind of do experiments and trial and errors. So what I did was I researched, like, the highest known – uh, companies for what they did. So the distributor that I currently use is like at the top of the list and they are all about nature and natural and just doing things right. And I appreciated that. Um, and I just stuck with it. And, and I'm sort of a creature of nature. So once I find something that actually works, I try to stick with it. And then so far it's worked for me. I've been literally using the same distributor or the company for my oil blend since this is 2000, so my daughter's 14, so it's maybe since like 2010. And until they say, okay, <laughs> we no longer can, you know, produce this, I, you know, I'm going to continue to go and, and use that service because they have, a, they have essentially made my business what it is today as far as the oil blend, for sure. So crossing our fingers here that that does not happen for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and do you include fragrance in your, in your products as well? I do. So for the oil blend, I don't necessarily add a fragrance. I just let the actual essential oils do what they do. So we all know that essential oils are very concentrated and they have the fragrance that they have. So um, for me, with my oil blend, I have a, a peppermint and I also have a citrus oil that helps make up that blend. And those are the two dominant fragrances that you would you would smell if you were to open a, a bottle of my oil. After that, I didn't feel like there was a need to add anything else. Again, and I wanted to make it less skin irritant as possible. So just letting the, the uh, essential oils do their normal thing was kind of what I did for that. Um, as far as my, my butter creams, my twisting creams, I did add a, a fragrance to those. And reason being is because when I did a research or a survey out to potential customers, the question was, would you prefer scented or unscented? And of course, the, the ones who had like a sensitive skin issue, they would pre preferably prefer the unscented. And even they wanted the scented. Um, they would kind of like wanted to deal with it as opposed to not. So um, that played a heavy factor in whether I was going to add a specific fragrance. And I and eventually I ended up just doing that for my, my twisting creams. 
Well, and your so your shop mission, your your focus is love for natural hair and scalp care for the entire family. And now I there is more of a natural hair movement, and you know, not to mention more interest in natural ingredients, which is what we've been talking about for the hour. You know, what has your response in terms of attempts at greenwashing? You know, saying something that is organic or free from something when it might not be. Right. So. The natural hair care community has grown over the past 10 or 13 years and it's become to the point where it's almost oversaturated. Whereas you go into a store and you see this plethora of products and you don't know where to begin, you don't know what to do, and you don't know who to ask. Um, And because everyone's gearing towards that, you know, natural, safe, um, harmless, product-free element, you kind of have to do your own due diligence. You can't just take it for what it is. Of course, a label will be a label, but then if you turn around that bottle around and you see those ingredients that you don't recognize, Googling one or two of them will honestly save you a lifetime of just complications, irritations, and confusion. Um, So I think that even as a consumer, just walking into a store and picking up a product because it says what it says, it's still important to kind of do your own uh, research. I don't for say become like a, a professor in the, in the field, but honestly just to get the basics, just so you understand what you're using, how you're supposed to use it and what the ingredients entail. That's very important when it comes to anything, anything in general. So, yeah. I mean, I think we're having much more information exposure about this and more people are talking about it. And sort of with that in mind, are you noticing more women switching to natural hair after more findings on the potential impacts of using relaxers? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've seen an increase in natural hair, uh, you know, the transitioning from relaxed hair to natural hair care within the past six to eight years. It's been a huge increase, which obviously made the market increase for products to be available. Um, I don't necessarily know what everyone's personal reason is for that particular increase and change, but I do have, I do have a feeling that it has to do with kind of getting to, you know, the self-care thing and loving who you are as a person and, you know, just understanding that there are harmful ingredients that we no longer have to deal with now. There's options, you know, whereas 10, 15 years ago, we didn't have as many options. So um, I think there are a plethora of reasons as, as to why people are transitioning, but for the most part, primarily it's health and primarily it's just um, being comfortable in your own skin. So we got about two minutes left, but I do want to ask, because we have been talking a lot about uh, so much information, so many ingredients and things that we recognize and don't recognize and can't um, pronounce. There is a kind of burnout, I think, uh, consumers feel, especially, you know, the market is so saturated with all of the things that we've been talking about. It's hard for any one person to take all of that on. You know, what have you heard from your customers about how big trust is and being able to find that trust with your products? Right. So uh, what I'm finding now is that a lot of people are, um, attaching themselves to popular people. Like we have our celebrities out there now de- developing products and because they already have that trust, the, the, the consumers already have that trust because of their celebrityism, they kind of draw themselves to their products and it may or may not benefit them. So for me personally, having that one-on-one or one-on-five conversation with someone is everything. I get so many clients and customers coming into me thanking me for just that education piece because you don't get that when you walk into a hair supply store. There's no owner of a business selling your product and telling you why. It's just a price tag and a cashier. So to have someone who can, you know, physically be there and kind of educate you and guide you on your journey, it's a plus. It's an absolute plus for the the natural hair uh, consumers. Well, I'm going to be doing a lot of reading after this show. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Uh, you've been listening to Mecca Davis Provide, who is the owner of Rutuals Natural Hair Care. Thanks for sharing your story. Thank you. I'm Catherine Shen. Today's show is produced by Katie Pellico. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor. Download Where We Live anytime on your favorite podcast app. And thank you so much for listening. <laughs>